Well, just like a good farmer spends time digging over his soil in the paddock prior to planting, he, he tills that soil, he, he turns that same soil over and over, he's softening it up to get it ready to receive the seed at planting time, just like that. Well, that's what you've been doing in the last session. The previous session, you've been turning over the passages in Genesis that we've begun to look at, and I'm, I'm hopeful now that uh, some of the things that you have discussed, some of the things that you've seen yourself in your own Bible, that you've thought through uh, in your own minds as the questions were asked and there was interaction in your group, I want to pick up perhaps on some of those things, maybe dig a little deeper, as it were, in the same soil as we think together now in this session more specifically of the context of walking with God. And I'm hopeful, maybe you've already done this, you've already seen this, I want to underline really how incredibly relevant this part of the early section of Genesis is for our walking with God today. Now, let's leave the farming scene, let's go for a pleasant paddle. If you've ever gone canoeing and you've been in one of those places where there's a tide or maybe there's a fast moving stream and you're in your canoe, you're in your, your boat and you're paddling up against the tide, you know what you've got to do. If you're going to make progress, you've got to keep going, you've got to keep at it, you've got to persevere if you are going to make headway. The moment you stop paddling, you don't stand still. The moment you stop paddling, you quickly go backwards because the pull of the current takes you in that direction. Well, that's exactly what it's like in our walk with God. The pull of the world will take us in the other direction. As long as we stay close to God and as long as we are dependent upon Him and we are know, knowing and experiencing the enabling of the grace of God and we continue to walk with Him, we will make progress. But once we ease up, once we, we stop, as it were, fulfilling those things that God gives for us to do, we don't stand still in our walk with God, we actually go backwards. You see, we're either going forward in our walk with God or today we're slipping back. So there's either progress forward or there is what is often being said, backsliding. And so what I've just said there describes every Christian who's in this shed right now. Either there's progress in your walk with God or you're going slipping back, backsliding. Fundamental, you see, to the concept of walking is the idea of progress. Unless we're talking about walking on a treadmill where you don't go anywhere except you're doing exercises, you're standing in the same spot. Unless we're talking that, which is not the normal way we understand walking with God, right? The normal way we talk about walking is we are making progress. And so as we think of Enoch and Noah, and they're the characters of our focus uh, this weekend, they made progress, they made advancement, we might say, in their walk of faith, they made advancement in their walk of fellowship, they made advancement in their walk of holiness, as we saw those things last evening. In their everyday lives, they made progress, and our thoughts now need to be thinking about the context. Where was it that they were making such progress? And I raise this to help further think through so that we can see together that we really can't say, well, the reason they walk with God was because the pull of the tide of the world wasn't as strong back in those days as it is for now and us and for me. Enoch and Noah, they were great men of God. And I'm just plain old me. And in my case, almost everything, it seems, and almost everyone is against me walking with God. And so it must have been so much easier for Enoch and Noah to, to, to walk with God. Their environment, their life must have been far more condu conducive to have a close walk with God than obviously mine is from mine experience. Well, I want us to raise three main areas when it comes to the context of walking with God for us to see how it relates to us. And if you're following in your notes, you'll see the three main headings. And the first of them 
And I'm not sure whether you would have got into this, maybe some of you did in your discussion group, but what I'm simply calling minimal revelation. Minimal revelation. What I'm raising here is for just for us for a moment to think about Enoch and Noah. They did not have what you have sitting on your laps. They did not have a Bible. They did not have an Old Testament and obviously they did not have a New Testament. There's no question, though, that they had understanding. God clearly had revealed certain truths to them. In fact, we mentioned this last night in relation to Enoch, that, that Jude tells us that Enoch knew stuff. He was a prophet. He was a preacher. Peter tells us about Noah that he, was, he called him a preacher of righteousness. And so both are described in that way. And for these men to be declaring truth, they had to know stuff. And so it's not that they had no understanding. No, they didn't have a Bible like you and I, but they still had understanding. And so here's the question I, I, I want to raise for us to think through. Back to the Genesis 5 passage that you looked at before. How did they know stuff? Where did they get their information from? Now, one answer we could give, and I quickly gave it last night, was that, well, God obviously told them. But how did God tell them? How did it come down to them? And this is one of the fascinating things I hope that you discovered in the pre-flood era of humanity. And what I'm talking about at this point is how long people lived. And you've quickly done that scan in Genesis chapter 5 and you no doubt saw the, the tremendous overlap of generations that existed in that period up until the, the flood, as we call it. You know, when you look more carefully at the, the actual figures, you actually discover, and maybe you saw this when you did it on the graph, that's the reason I gave you that diagram sort of approach, is that Adam was still alive when Enoch walked with God. It's not something you normally think of, but as you put the figures together, that's something that comes to us in that passage. Adam was 622 years old when Enoch was born. Adam didn't, uh, Adam didn't die until he was 930. For 300 years, Enoch could have heard firsthand from great, 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 great grandpa Adam certain truths, you see. First hand. Adam could explain to him firsthand the, the world's former beauty of what it was like before sin entered, the exquisite taste that he had in the garden, the incredible sounds that his ears could drink in, the dazzling sights that he saw before the world was spoiled. Adam could have told Enoch that firsthand. Adam could have obviously personally spoken about his sin in the garden and the tragic consequences of the curse and what he saw firsthand in his life and what it did to his relationship with his wife and all the horrors that unfolded with his own children and so on. It was Adam who heard about the first promise of salvation or redemption through the seed and the place of sacrifice in approaching God. And so you see the point. By the time that Adam died, Enoch had been walking with God for 235 years. And he did so without a Bible in his hand. And when you then just swap and think of Noah, his own father, Lamech, was 45 years old by the time Adam died. So Noah wasn't alive at the same time as Adam, but his own direct father was 45 when Adam died. And what I just said about Enoch applies to Lamech. Noah's own dad could have heard firsthand from Adam a number of things. And you see, both the point is both Enoch and Noah did know many things. They certainly did. But compared to us... They had little light, we might say. What, what we have is like a bright light, a bright beam compared to what Adam and, sorry, compared to what Enoch and Noah had. We have a complete Bible. We have the full revelation of God to man. And here we are. Most of us, I'm sure, probably got multiple copies of 
Bibles available to us or access to us. It's the book in which God speaks to us. We live at a time when there's been centuries of godly men who have come before us, who have been studying their Bibles. The Spirit of God has been at work for centuries, guiding men into all truth. Enoch and Noah had minimal light, limited and limited or minimal revelation, but they still made progress. And here we are with so much more light. God's written word, His Spirit poured out, God's church about us, so many of these things. And all of those things are a great assistance for us to be able to walk with God. And so really what that is saying is we really have no excuse. As we compare ourselves to, to, to Enoch and Noah in terms of walking with God, if we're not making progress, it, it, that means we're going backwards. We're backsliding and it's almost guaranteed when that happens, it's because we are missing out or we're not receiving what we should be receiving by way of Bible input. You see, none of us can sustain a close walk with God, no matter who we are, no matter how long we've been Christians. None of us can, can, can sustain a close walk with God without having part of the discipline of our lives, the daily reception of the Word of God, of God's revelation to us written down here. And so if we're not receiving the written revelation, we won't be going forwards. And if we're not going forwards, it means we will be pulled with the tide and we'll be going backwards. As we've already seen, to walk with God involves fellowship. It involves communion, remember? And as we thought about this just in terms of the analogy last night, when we go for a walk with someone, it's just natural that we engage in conversation. That's a natural thing to do. And so any walk with God can only be sustained by God regularly speaking to us through His Word and us communicating back with Him through prayer, private prayer. And so I want to encourage you to establish good routines in your life, in this stage in your life, in your youth, that routines that can stay with you for your entire life. Here's the thing. If you don't establish those firm patterns of meeting with the Lord privately, receiving His Word, privately praying, and even meeting with God's people, they've always been the ways that God has sustained the walks with His people. If we don't establish them as firm patterns, if we're not meeting with God's people every week now, it's going to be so much harder later when responsibilities increase for you, and they will increase. When the struggles and demands of life increase, and they will increase, for you to be able to maintain a close walk with God and you to put aside the means that God has given for you will mean you will be slipping back more than you will be making progress. And so I want to encourage you to establish those routines now in uh, your youth and, and cultivate not just the disciplines, uh, they're so important, but not just that, as I, I think I said this last night, but as well cultivating an awareness of God's presence in your life every day through the day. The thought I'm living in God's presence so that I can speak with Him through the day as the one who I am walking with in those little every moment ways. So I said, like sending off a text message, it's a short, sharp prayer to heaven throughout the day, not just that time in the day when you pray but cultivating a relationship throughout the day. But perhaps you say, well, all that's very good and that's probably what we expected you to say, Pastor, but you obviously don't understand the pressures in my life. It can be tough. Well, friends, let's think again about Enoch and the context of walking with God. We thought quickly about the minimal revelation, but now let's think secondly about normal expectation. And let's come back to our Bibles, to Genesis chapter 5, and let's think again about Enoch and what I'm calling normal expectations, the normal things in life. Okay, we're just seeing what this says. Genesis 5 and verse 23 where it tells us again in this text, so all the days of Enoch were 365. 
I don't know whether they celebrated birthdays back then, but that's a lot of birthday celebrations. I mean, that's a big number uh, uh, as we would look at it. Imagine being 365 years old. Now, I did a quick calculation, and you've gone through chapter 5 before. You saw all the different ages of the, the points when the various generations, the various men in that family tree died. I quickly went through the average length of age that comes to us from this chapter. Up until the time of Enoch's generation, people on average were living 919 years. Think of how that compares to now. According to Google, the average Aussie male leave, lives up until he's, he is 84 and a half years. Ladies, you do a bit better. Aussie ladies make it to 87.3 years, which shows that you have an easier life, right? As we think of 919 years, compared to the way that we're so used to the, the time frame that is in our mind for what life is. If, if we put Enoch's lifespan, what I'm trying to say is put Enoch's lifespan and put it in terms of our lifespan. He lived 365 years in the passage, but if he was in our day, in our lifespan, that would be roughly 34 years old. Okay, so you got the idea. He, he, he left the earth early in terms of the normal pattern of life in averages. When did he start walking with God? We've gone through this already. We saw this last night. Enoch began walking with God at 65. Fascinating. For us, 65, that's a golden age, isn't it? For many people, it's, it's, it's when life begins to wind down or wind up in terms of what you want to do yourself because that's retirement age. That's the golden age. And it's the golden age. But in Enoch's day, when you were 65, you were but a pup. You're just a young guy. And again, translating the age difference and putting it in terms of 65 years back then to now, that means Enoch started to walk with God when roughly for our terms he was about 15. He's in his youth. That's the point I'm trying to show to you. Enoch began to walk with God when he was a young person. He was only 65. And that's young when you, when you normally get to 920 roundabout. And so here's the thing. It wasn't that Enoch had his fling in youth and thought, I'll walk with God later on when I settle down. No, actually, when you do the sums for 80%, over 80% of his life, he walked with God and, and that even ended when he was young. And so he obviously started very early in his life. Me personally, I find that very encouraging when we just stop and work through those figures and try and work out what that means and for us to relate to. That is telling me that young people can walk with God. That, that young people can sustain a walk with God in their youth years. I know 34 for some of you, for many of you, maybe except maybe one of you, um, seems like an old age. But 34 is still relatively young compared to 84 to 87, right? And so if he's walking from 15 to 34, he's walking with God, he's sustaining his walk with God consistently in the days of his life. You. So I'm raising those points to encourage you that you're in that category. Now's the time that you can walk with God. It is possible. I want you to see with me something else that's here. Let's just come back and think about the pressures, though, the, the difficulties, the struggles, even in this stage in life. Just come back and see the normal pressures that come out as it's listed in the text in verse 21. Enoch lived 65 years, begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God. And we mentioned this quickly last night. Enoch clearly then, it's told to us by Moses, he began his walk with God from the time of the birth of his first son. And then he kept it up for 300 years. Verse 22 tells us, and I didn't read that part, at the end, and we haven't made reference to this yet, but at the end of verse 22 it says, and he had sons and daughters. 
How many kids do you think you could have in 300 years? Some years ago, we, my wife and I, um, had friends. Uh, we're still friends with them, I guess. We haven't seen them for many years. And uh, at that point, they had been married for 15 or 20 years. And the last count we heard, they had about 15 kids. Um, and then she had trouble in terms of bearing children and it slowed down. So, so it's 20 years and you've got 15 kids. How many kids could you have in 300 years? It's extraordinary when you stop and think about it, midwives. I mean, you'd be busy, right? Sons and daughters, the text said. And so that's the context of be not walking with God. Now, that's put together by the Holy Spirit. Walking with God, having this baby and having all these other babies. Now go to chapter 6 and notice something similar. Chapter 6 and verse 9. And we've read this before, but we'll just take you to the last part of verse 9. Noah walked with God and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth. And so the point is simply that both the cases that are put before us of men who walk with God is done in the normal context of the pressures of life. And as men, obviously, it would have been, these are the men that are going out to work to help support a growing family. They had to earn the living. They're doing this day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. In their case, decade after decade and century after century. And so they've got the normal demands of life. No sick leave. No long service leave. Imagine how much you could accrue if that's how long you worked for. They're busy. A busy, busy, busy life. And in our terms, we would say, well, they had expenses, they had debts perhaps, they had mortgage to pay off, they had certainly mouths to feed, they had crying babies at home, they had dirty nappies, they had discipline issues with little children, they had bills to pay, they had questioning teenagers, they had emotional uh, wives. You talk about the normal expectations and the pressures of life, these guys had it all right, they had all of it. And they also, I would say to you, had the usual heartaches of living in a fallen world. And doesn't that come out really clearly in chapter 5? What's the repeated phrase in chapter 5? And he died. And he died. And he died. And he died. But there was one of those deaths that must have had such an incredible, profound impact on the entire human family. And that was when Adam died. Can you imagine the day the news spread that the father of our family, the first man on this earth, that God, him, he was never born in that sense, that God actually fashioned out of dirt and he started as a man, that that man died? You imagine the earthquake, as it were, when that news spread, as it rippled through the population and the family that descended from him of his death? And then add to that all the, all the others that had died and died and died, as the chapter says. They're like a, a forest of trees and they're, and they're massive trees being cut down and they fall to the ground and cause this great tremor as the reality of death begins to hit home. Six of Noah's forefathers crashing to the ground in his lifetime, not to mention all the other rallies like cousins and uncles and aunts and so on. And so here's, here's, it's not just the busyness of life, it's also the, these men experience the normal sadnesses, the, the traumas, the, the heartaches associated with living life in a fallen world. Think of the setbacks. Think of the disappointments these men had. Think of Noah, he's a preacher of righteousness and his own family reject him. Yes, his sons get in the boat and their wives get in the boat. But what about all his cousins? What about all Noah's uncles? What about all the other family members that reject him? The disappointments and the heartaches that this must have been for this man, Noah. These men went through the normal things we all experience. They were not off by themselves on, on a hill somewhere under a tree like a monk being super spiritual. It was in the context of the ordinary, the pressures of work, 
the family life, the, the daily stresses, the, the regular disappointments, that's when they were walking with God. And yet what do we tend to do? We, we certainly can tend to look for excuses and why it is we can't walk with God or at least have a very close one. We can see ourselves as an exception. I mean, it's okay for Enoch and Noah. I mean, they could walk with God, but not me. I mean, my case is special. That's what we often think. My case is a, a unique set of circumstances. And if it, But you see, if it wasn't for such pressures that I have at work, or if it wasn't for the demands I fear with my studies, well, then I could walk with God. If I, if I didn't have these things that are a disappointment in my life, well, then I could walk with God. Not, not If I didn't have so many knockbacks and setbacks. If I didn't live at home with all the tensions, I could walk with God then. Or, you know, if I wasn't single, it would be easier for me to walk with God or we could change that up. If I wasn't married, I'd be freer to walk with God. If I wasn't too busy... If my wife didn't go through all her emotional ups and downs, I'd be able to walk with God. If I had more time, if, if I could just have things easier in the workplace, in my life, I then could walk with God. And all of those sentences start with the word if. If, if this and if that and if the other. When we see the real context of Enoch and Noah's life, the normal Expectation for all of us. All those thoughts and all these ifs are shown up for what they are. They are excuses. They are not reasons. You see, this is the context that we should, that we must, and that we can walk with God. That's what these passages are showing us. We can walk with God. You can walk with God. It is possible even with the normal expectation. Well, the third thing I want to draw your attention to, and it's probably more in this area that you developed in your discussion, I would imagine, and it's what I'm calling cultural degeneration. Just before we get into that, I just want to take you back for a little bit of light relief. <laughs> take you back to the scene of being in a canoe. That's more relaxing, isn't it? That's, that's calm. It's a pleasant task when there's no pull of the tide. But when you find yourself up against it's a strong current, well then it is a little bit more wearisome and tiresome. Well, think of that scene as it describes these men and the society in which they walked. The current in their day, the, the overall pull of the tide of their of their environment, of the climate of their culture was a tide that was very strong and it was constantly, constantly pulling against them. It's not like there was a turn of a tide and so, okay, we know in about three hours the tide's going to come back the other way and we'll just sit out on the beach and then we'll be right. Well, they didn't have a turning of the tide in their day as far as we know. If we go back into Genesis chapter 4, which is where I want to take you now. The second half of chapter 4 is his description of the ungodly line through Cain. Chapter 5 gets us into the godly line through Seth. But here in chapter 4, we're told about the character of Lamech. Did you, did you read about him? Perhaps you thought a little bit about him. He's actually the seventh generation in the ungodly line. This is a wonderful thing God does here in chapter 4 and 5. Seventh generation in the ungodly line. We go over into chapter 5, and guess who's the seventh generation in the godly line? It's Enoch. And so what the Spirit of God is doing, even in chapter 4 and chapter 5, is setting up for us this clear contrast and helping us to understand the context and the setting of this man Enoch containing, sustaining his consistent walk with God. God. And so if we go back to Lamech, it's, he's mentioned there in chapter 4 and verse 23. He's the, he's the first character in the Bible that we come across who takes more than one wife. That's mentioned uh, uh, back in verse 19, actually. So Lamech's the man who defied God's pattern laid down in Eden for marriage. And we see where some of this rebellion ends up taking him. 
His poem, we might call it, in verses 23 and 24, is him celebrating his bigamy and brutality. He's a cruel man. He's a violent man from his own words. He's a, he's a man who's proud of his sin. He's openly mocking God's punishment. He's obviously a hard man, hardened in his sin toward God and toward others. But in the midst of this hard-heartedness, we see that there's also cultural development. Let's now look at a couple of verses. Verse 20, chapter 4, verse 20. It says, And Adar bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. And here, I love some of these verses. This is so descriptive and helpful for us understanding these early days. Here is agricultural development in early humanity. Jabal, here he is with his livestock. I was thinking of Jake when I was preparing. This is the original cattleman. Okay, that, That's who this guy is, the original cattleman. Look at verse 21. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the harp and flute. So he's the father of music. He's the father of arts, we might say today. Jubal Cain introduces skilled craftsmanship. Look at verse 22. And as for Zilah, she also bore Jubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. And so he's a craftsman, but he's not just a craftsman. He's, he's an instructor. He's an educator, we might say today. And so what do we see here, you engineers? Here's the start of the engineering skills. That there's industrial advancement here. There's the birth of the education sector. And all of this, no doubt, is contributing to the economic growth and the social development in the society in those early days. And yet, though all this cultural advancement is is happening and all these great things that man is doing there's no mention of the glory of God there's no mention of this being done to God's praise that this is the ungodly line and yet nevertheless this is a culture that is developing right up until the seventh generation and that is in comparison to the godly line of Enoch down through Seth of the um, the man who walked with God. Now we know within 70 years of Enoch's departure, Noah was born. Okay, so it was about a 70 year period. For us, that's a, that's a lifetime, but think in their terms, it's a relatively shorter period of time. But, and Noah comes. And now if we go into chapter 6, what was it that Noah was experiencing? Well, we see moral degeneration clearly presented to us as I would understand this expression, these references to the sons of God, some would think that's angels. I think that's not the case. The term sons of God can be used that way elsewhere in the Bible, but I don't think that fits the context of what's being described in these chapters. It's a reference to those who are in the godly line. They are the sons of the godly line. Chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And so here's the first explicit statement of the godless society that puts it in terms of men making what we may say body worship or the focus for the men in choosing women in relation to marriage was all about what they saw. That's what it says. They saw the beauty of these women and therefore they took them as wives. Their, their attention was not their character. Their attention was not drawn to their conduct in godliness. Their, their attention was drawn to what they saw, their figure, their form, the shape of their body. That was the thing that drew their attention. That was the priority. That was their mindset. That was where they were headed. In other words, that's a sensual culture. That's a godless sensual culture. Context, And that's the context in which we go on to read in verse 9 that, that Noah walked with God, that he was blameless. He's surrounded by strong sexual sin. 
He's surrounded by all this bare flesh flaunting itself in front of his eyes. He's, he's a man and he's a normal man in that sense. And this alluring temptation was right in front of him, but that's the context in which he maintained a blamelessness. That's, how, that's where he had a clear conscience. And furthermore, if we go to verse 5, it tells us about the depth of depravity. On the earth in those days, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. It's a violent society. It's not just a sensual society. And again, that's mentioned. The violence is again mentioned in verse 13. And so in our terms, we, we know that the phrase is used to talk about a violent society today, child abuse, domestic violence or bashings and murders. Uh, all such things would have been rampant in those days. And so verse 12 says, so God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And so is it not obvious that this is a culture that's ripe for judgment? It's cultured. In, in terms of its development, but it's secular. It's clever, but it's proud. It's sensual, and it's violent. And th this is the strong current of the world. It's moving like a, a swift moving river, and it's heading toward this precipice. It's about to fall headlong into judgment. And look with me now at verse 13, because that's what this, the passage goes on to say God was going to do. He said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Chapter 7 records that society in which Enoch and Noah lived was so corrupt that we know the story, God wiped it out. And so here's the thing I'm just wanting to put in front of you, that the godless culture that we've just quickly seen described by these texts in this part. That's the setting. That's the place. That's the context that these men sustained a close walk with God for hundreds of years. And so here's the thing. This is why I'm saying we simply have no grounds for thinking, well, I can't walk with God because things are just so bad out there. Look, I mean, look at the political leaders. Look what they're taking our nation. It, it's up against it. it. It's so hard for me to walk with God in this culture. And if you only knew the, the temptations that I'm exposed to, then you'd understand why I can't walk with God. The, the things that come across my social media feed uh, or my screen, they're so hard for me to walk with God. The ungodly family members that, that interrupt my walk with God, I, I mean, I can't help that. And my life seems to be so full with pushbacks and setbacks. I'm disappointed. I, I feel all out of sorts. I can't walk with God. Well, it's true that you and I are living in a culture that is degenerating fast. That's, that's obvious for us all to see. And it's one that has clear parallels to these passages in Genesis. Our society is secular. Our society is clever. Our society is sensual. Our society is violent. And that's the society that Enoch and Noah walked with God in. And so one thing is very plain. By the grace of God, it is possible for us to walk with God as well. God's grace has not lost any of its power, any of its sufficiency. The Spirit is not weaker today or diminished in His influence in power than He was before. And so it's possible to row against the tide. It's actually possible to go against the current and maintain a consistent progress in our walk with God. The answer is not, and it's never been, to withdraw from society. The answer is not to give up. The answer is not to run away. The answer is to stick close to your God. You know, all the strength that we need to do this is right there available for us right now. It's not some magic potion, not some special trick you've got to learn this weekend to work out how to walk close with God. It's all there for us right now if we're believers. And I want to turn you to one last passage before we melt in this heat. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. 
And here I want to encourage you that it is possible for you to walk with God despite the pushbacks and the setbacks and the frustrations and the disappointments and the heartaches and the struggles and the temptations all around us. 2 Peter chapter 1, look with me. 2 Peter chapter 1, follow with me, verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith, faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Saviour Jesus Christ. He's writing to Christians whose hope is the righteousness of God in Christ. Verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. In many ways that describes Enoch and Noah. They escaped all those temptations of lust and it was done through the power of God, through the promises of God. They found all that they needed in the Lord for them to be able to walk with God in the context of cultural degeneration. You know what our culture needs the most and sort of wants the least is a new generation like yours. People like everyday Enoch's and everyday Noah's who walk close with God by his grace and in his strength. And so my prayer has been for you guys this weekend that God would make you more and more that bunch for the new generation. Look at Enoch. Look at Noah. What do you see? Yes, heroes of the faith, but they're ordinary men. They got the struggles that you've got. Look at Enoch, look at Noah, and what do you see? You see, it is possible to walk with God. It truly is in a life like mine. The pull of the world's tied. Yes, it's strong. It's actually way too strong for you and your own strength to overcome it. The remains of corruption within each believer renders us weak within ourselves to find the strength in ourselves to do it. It's not about us. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Without him, you can't begin to walk with him. Without him, you can't continue to walk with him. And this is what makes the resources that are available in the Lord so wonderful. All the power of the Godhead is available to us. His spirit, his promises. And here's the positive way that Paul puts it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things, including walking with God closely in my life, but it's in his strength. God has supplied us with the means that will enable us to sustain our walk with him, the private means of grace. Put that aside. No wonder we struggle. The private means of the word and prayer and meditation and self-examination, they're gifts from him. But he's given us other gifts as well to help us. He's given us the means of grace in his church. He's given us one another. He's given us the fellowship of the saints. He's given us the preaching of the word of God. He's given us corporate prayer. The ordinances in his church, they are all gifts to help us, to strengthen us in our walk with him. We have so much more than Enoch and Noah. They could walk with God. And so here's the question I simply want to ask you. Are you walking with God? Is it a close walk with God? Well, if any of us are walking with God at all, that is a testimony to the work and the grace and the power of God at work within us. The fact that Enoch could sustain his walk for three centuries is testimony to the same thing, of God's sustaining grace. Not that he's clever, not that he's got some secret that we don't have, but it's the sustaining grace of God. And that's the hope. 
Therein lies the hope for us and the answer, as it will, for, for us in our walk with God, to have a close walk with God, to cultivate and to achieve a close walk with God is by His grace in the power of Christ working within us, even in the context and where you, where you live, even at your address, yep, even in your workplace, even in the setting where you find it difficult, yep, that's the very place that God's grace can sustain and enable you to walk close with Him. And so this is one of the things I wanted us to be careful that we don't conclude in our study of Enoch and Noah. It's not time for us to pat these guys on the back and just sort of say to them, well, good job, boys. Good on you for walking with the Lord. I admire you for it. No, all glory goes to God that they could walk with Him. And if you're walking with God, and if you've got a close walk with God, all glory goes to God. Let's pray. Our blessed Lord, we thank you for keeping for us these little snippets and insights scattered through these passages when we bring them together that help us to see the real world in which these men, ordinary men like us, with ordinary struggles and families and issues, were able to walk with you. And for all the grace that you gave them and the way in which you sustained them, we worship you this morning. We cry out to you and we call to you, praying and asking that you would give to us grace, much grace, more grace, Lord, a grace we know that is inexhaustible, supply available, that we ourselves could truly walk with you in a close and glorious way in the days to come. Be merciful to us, we pray, that you may get all the glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.